turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. As I said earlier, and I want to introduce it this way, that, you know, marriage is that picture of Jesus in the church between the husband and the wife. It's that same picture. You know, chapter 7 begins with a section, a section of where the Corinth church is actually asking questions, this letter that had written prior, and Paul starts giving answers to these questions asked. These previous letters, which we don't know where they're at, but the fact is he's answering these questions, and this one's going to be pertaining to marriage and intimacy and sex and things of that nature. See, the, the questions the Corinth church brought up, and many times, maybe those in the church today need to bring up these questions. Questions of here that, like I say, were pertaining to marriage, he's going to speak, the intimacy and the sexual relationship in marriage there. They were sincere with their question. Paul did not think they were not sincere at all in any way. You know, and then in uh, chapter, you remember back in chapter 5 and 6, Paul had already spoke about those improper relationships, those pornea or sexual immorality. He's already rebuked those things. And so that's part of why this question comes up from them now. The reports had come to Paul, as we've seen in chapter 5, about you know, this man being with his father's wife. And he said, no, no, that's pornea. That's sexual immorality. You cannot have that in the church. He said, you got to stop that. you got to rebuke that. you got to call it out. you got to remove that one. He even said, deliver him to Satan, right? But he told him, deliver him to Satan for the destruction of his, that man's flesh and not his spirit. Sometimes that's the best thing we can do, church, is uh, <sighs> called church discipline. You kind of remove them for a while, and then they, they miss the family. They miss the body of Christ. They repent to God, and, and they come back, and they're restored. In 1 Corinthians 5, 5, he said, Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Deliver him to Satan, he said there. He told him, keep the church clean, keep the church holy. And in chapter 6, again, he hits this whole thing about this pornea. He deals with pornea again. These men and these within the church and these leaders were using prostitutes. These leaders were using these prostitutes. They said, no. They were using that because they based their sin that they were doing on what was lawful in Corinth. Prostitutes were very lawful in Corinth. Hey, we're, we're staying with the law. The sin of the culture of Corinth led them astray, right? Well, they accepted. It must be okay. Well, Paul rebuked it, right? And Paul actually stated there that, you know, those things that are lawful does not make it right. We got to understand that today. Though there may be laws on the book, they're not right in God's eyes. What do we go by? We go by God's word. We can't go by the culture. And even if there's laws on the book, it doesn't make it right. We can't just accept it because, hey, the law says it's okay. And I'll use this word. Sin is sin, right? We talked about these degrees of sin, levels of sin. Well, sin is sin. And sin cannot be accepted and will not be accepted in God's eyes. It won't be tolerated. It won't be justified just because of the law of the land or the culture of the land, you see. You know, I like to say uh, sin starts slow. You ever see that movie, It's a Slow Fade? Man, that was a powerful movie. Sin starts slow. In much of our nation, and I mentioned this before, we've seen sin and first they, you tolerate it. You tolerate that sin. Well, okay, live and let live, right? And then they take you to the point now where they want you to accept the sin, and still we're just kind of the church has been, well, you know, okay. They got gay marriage, whatever, you know. Well, then they bring it to the point of wanting you to celebrate it, you see. So first you tolerate it, then you accept it, and now they want you to celebrate it. We had a whole month of that, right? I mentioned that before. Now they want you to celebrate it. And then from celebrating and what is being preached at our, I say preached to our children today, is participating then. They want you to go from celebrating now on into participating. That's a progression of sin, you see. Where does sin start? Now, we talked about sin earlier here. Well, sin starts with our own desires. The Bible tells us it starts with our own flesh, our own thoughts within our head, you know. It does not come from God. There's no testing by God. It's, oh, I'm going to test this person with a, with a temptation, 
and let's see if they pass it. No, God cannot do that. God will have nothing to do with evil. God does not tempt you. In James 1, 13 through 15. Now, I'm going to break these up. Okay, here's verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm tempted by God. For God cannot tempt, be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. So where does sin come from? We're going to go into that in a minute. Where do the desires and the thoughts, where do they come from, you know? Sinful man, sinful woman. I'm including you ladies in there. You know, we always like to use man. Well, there's sinful woman too. Verse 14, but each one, James Wright, is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. There, you see? Drawn away by his own sin, his own desires. Enticed in his own flesh or her own flesh. This is where sin comes from. And sin has this progression, just as I spoke about there. First, you tolerate it, right? And you kind of accept it there. And then you begin to uh, celebrate it, maybe even, and then participate in it. It's enticing of our own flesh. Sin progresses and steadily, as the Bible says, leads to death. Grows to death in full. In verse 15 of James, then when desire has conceived, right? Like a, like a child being conceived in the womb. When desire has conceived, it gives birth, what, to sin, you see. And sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. The culture of the land. We cannot go by that. The law of the land. It still is no excuse for the Christian because we are bound by God's word. No matter what the laws in the land say. Now, Paul now, as we go in here to chapter 7. Paul is going to uh, speak about what's holy and true and right within a marriage. He's going to go back into basically, I want to say, guys, he kind of gives us sex education here. You know, I'm going to mention that later. And he's going to talk to us about what is, what is right, what is holy. And the, the church in Corinth asked this question sincerely, and he gives us a sincere answer also. You know, in that, between the union of man and woman in a marriage. This is what Paul's going to be speaking about. And then the, the intimacy, and that is to be part of the marriage and always has been. And so, you know, a lot of times you go, dang, pastor, here we are again. You're saying sex 15 times in a message or 20 times in a message. And you know what? I'm, I'm old. My wife are old. And, you know, this isn't so part of our life. Let me ask you something, guys. Can you share that? Can you share God's word with your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren? Why do we want to learn this? So you can teach. You understand? How about a teenager that has these questions? They're not even your relative. Can you speak truth about marriage and God's design for intimacy for their lives? We need that, amen? So anyway, here we go again, all right? Let's pray first. Father God, I just thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word. God, as we, uh, we read your word, Father, I pray that uh, the hearts that need to be convicted, maybe, Lord, will be convicted. The hearts that need to be encouraged will be encouraged in the words here in 1 Corinthians, Lord. Father, through Paul's words, use your word for our well, edification, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Mm. So the title of my message is A Gift of Affection Do. Paul's going to be speak about in, in here the affections do. And, you know, marriage is really a gift. God gives us a great gift. You know, I want to make a note here. God's Word speaks much. In fact, it's the number one topic in the Bible about sexual immorality. His word condemns it and speaks much about it, about this pornea, right? And the pornea in man. It also speaks a lot about the purity of that intimacy, the purity of sex, and the intimacy within a marriage. God's word speaks about it. God's word speaks about uh, marriage in, in Ephesians. This here, we're going to see, God puts these two as one flesh. Now, in Ephesians, there's, a, there's an order for the family. But we're going to see in this message where God puts them on these equal terms as the husband and wife, which is wonderful. 
Guys, God created it. God created it. You know, when he, when he created Adam and Eve at their first time, God said, that is good, right? That is good. You know, he created sex or intimacy between one man and one woman in marriage. Can you teach that? Can you teach our youth that, you know? Nothing is sinful within that marriage bed, you see. It's God honoring. God is in the marriage, and it is honoring within there. I've used this scripture before, Hebrews 13, 4. Marriage is honorable among all. He says, honorable among all. In our world today, I wonder that. I really do. But I tell you, in a Christian's life, it's honorable among all. And the bed is undefiled. That time of intimacy between a man and a woman. But he does say, but fornicators and adulterers will be judged. Well, here we go again, like I say. Uh, sex and intimacy, right? I'm, I'm preaching it again. Guys, I have to teach God's word. You understand that, right? Line by line, verse by verse. Many pastors would jump by this. Oh, I don't want to talk to my congregation about this, you know. I would love if this whole place was full of teenagers, to be honest with you. I really would. Probably deliver the message differently. But the fact of the matter is, you know, this is a question now. And I want to make it clear that it was posed by the church in Corinth. And maybe there's some questions that need to be posed by the church today. Chapter 7, beginning in verse 1, Paul writes there, he says, Now uh, concerning the things of which you wrote me, concerning that letter, those questions, he's going to begin a series of answering questions as we continue continue through Corinthians here. He said, concerning the things of which you uh, wrote to me, and, he's, and they wrote to him, it, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. He makes it very clear. This touch means in a sexual relationship. But he backs it up really quick, and he says, nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, he says, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband there. Concerning the question, he says, that you posed me, it is good. It is good to stay away from that pornea. It is good to stay away from that sexual immorality. It is good not to touch a woman. That touch, like I said, is used in the sense here in the word in having sex with this one. Paul agreed with that question. He agreed with the question asked there. Yet he got straight to a point, right? He said, nevertheless, though... Nevertheless, because of the flesh's desires, a desire of a man, a desire of a woman, each need their own wife, and each need their own husband, period. Now, why did they ask that question? You might wonder within the Corinth church, why did they ask this? You know, he'd been slamming about this sexual immorality within, you know, within the church, them using prostitutes, saying, oh, this is bad. Why did he suggest this? Or why did they suggest, basically, celibacy, right? These leaders. They would say, well, Paul said, you know, it is good and right not to touch, right? Not to have this sexual immorality. And then Paul also said, you know, uh, a man should not be with a woman, you know? He said that. Sex must be bad, they would say, right? That within the, within the church, this leadership, sex must be bad. Why would they ask this in Corinth? You got to wonder that. You know, probably they did think along this line. If sex and, sexual immorality in that form puts you in danger of condemnation by God, well, then let's just stay completely away from it, even if we're married, right? This is where their heads went. You know, I'm going to be celibate now within the marriage there. I can be more holy that way, celibate, even within a marriage. And so this was their thinking. I got a commentator, Hodge. He writes here, he says, Corinth. And the idea that a marriage was less holy state than celibacy. This was their thought, right? That marriage, oh, that's, that's less holy than being celibate. Naturally led to the conclusion that a married person ought to separate. And it, uh, it soon became... Uh, to be regarded as an evidence then in imminent spirituality when such a separation was final, right? 
And so they thought of it this way, and it began to happen there. And so Paul's correcting him. You know, we got to look at the world today and those that still believe that. And you know where I'm going. The Catholic Church, right? The priest not being married. Holy. Only way I can be holy is to be celibate. It hasn't worked out so good for the Catholic Church. And you guys know what I mean. It has not worked out too good for them. I love my Catholic brothers and sisters. But nowhere in God's word, Paul says, he encouraged them. If you've got a lust of the flesh, you can get your tail out there and go get married and have a relationship there. Priests not being married. They had the same thought or within the Catholic church this they have in Corinth. Well, sex is bad. Obviously, it would be bad. You know, the only way to be holy is to be celibate. Sex is bad if I want to be honored by those I'm teaching. I, I got to be holy in this way, right? I can't have that in my life. I could never have sex. And we also know that they taught, they teach that Mary, the blessed mother of Jesus Christ, was a perpetual virgin. She was not. Why? Well, because sex would be bad. Mary was married. Mary was married. These Catholic, they teach us, Mary never, ever had sex. That's not what the Bible says. Turn your Bibles, please. Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1. And we read, yeah, was Mary the blessed woman? Amen. Was she ever blessed? She bore the Savior. Immaculate conception of the Holy Spirit. Mary was a virgin. And she could see Jesus. But Mary had sex. She had interrelation. She had relationship with her husband afterward. They would say, oh, you're blaspheming. You're blaspheming our Mary, right? Don't you can't say that. Because sex is bad. Word is God's word. God created it. God created this intimacy in a marriage. Mary is our holy, holy virgin. Go to Matthew chapter 1. Begin in verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, engaged to this man. Before they came together, that's intimately. They didn't come together. They're engaged. They're before they're married. They're not having any sexual relationship. She was found with child of the Holy Spirit. You can imagine Joseph. What? And then Joseph, her husband, being now a just man, loved Mary. He was betrothed to her. He was a just man, it says there. And not wanting to make her a public example, that's back in those days, that was not good, was minded, uh, was minded to put her away secretly, right? Okay, we'll just hide this situation. But while, he, uh, but while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. He says, don't you even be worried about it. She is, she has conceived, she is pregnant because of God, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin, amen, the virgin shall be with child, and she was, and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and he took to him his wife, and got married to her. And then what do we read in the next verse? And he did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Did not know or did not have that intimate sexual relationship with Mary until Jesus was born. After that, other children. Absolutely. He had brothers and sisters. If you want to call them half brothers and sisters, you can. But he, uh, she had, uh, and Jesus had brothers and sisters. Mary had other children. And guess what? Mary had intimate sexual relationships with her husband, which was God-ordained. So why would they struggle there, you know? See, we can see this idea of the Corinth church. We can see in the fact that they say, well, well sex has to be bad. 
and we need to be holy. Go on to verse 2 here again. Go back to Corinthians. And they said there, but Paul tells them, he says, nevertheless, because of this sexual immorality, because of this that could happen, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband there, right? Nevertheless, he says, get married and have that relationship. That's what it's for, you know. Paul continues. He's going to continue what I call sex education, church. All right? He's going to continue this for us here. God's design for sex. Let me ask you. I'm going to make a note here. If our schools would teach God's design for sex, would you have any problem with it? I wouldn't. Not one bit. Now, it needs to start a proper age. You don't teach a kindergartner this. Junior high, man. As soon as that puberty starts setting in. And they teach the, the truth of a marriage and what God designed beautifully. And you teach these young people that. That's what I'm saying. You might be old. Maybe I'm going way, you know. Hey, are you speaking to me anymore here? Yeah, I'm speaking to you. Because you got children and you got grandchildren. You got great grandchildren. Please, please teach them the truth about marriage and what it is to have these relationships here, you see. Like I say, if they taught it by God's word, I'd have no problem at all. No problem. They probably wouldn't let me in there, would they? <laughs> Go on to verse 3. It says, Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, he says, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, by the way, men, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does, Paul says. He says, now do not deprive one another except with consent. We know what he's speaking about. The affection do, right? Do not deprive one another um, except with cons uh, consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan now does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But then he says in verse 6, but I say this as a command, uh, as a, I'm sorry, a concession and not as a commandment. Paul wasn't making any new commandments, by the way, here, and he makes it very clear. But as we went into verse 3 and through 6 there, he speaks about God's design and a mutual responsibility between husband and wife. Isn't that beautiful? He literally puts them on equal ground. That her body is not her own and the husband's body is not his own, you see. And he puts them on this equal ground in that area. Paul's correcting the thought right back here earlier that a man should not touch a woman. That they ask, well, is it, that's probably the right thing to do. No, he said, get married. And then, but you render that wife, you render the wife the affection due, you see? It is wrong to withhold that affection. It is totally wrong. The affection that's due to her, this applies to all Christian marriages. The affection that is due, right? It's owed to her as Paul tells the husband, and he literally says, likewise to the wife, too. It's owed to him. Render that. Render to that wife. And he doesn't say, well, just the pretty one, or maybe just the young one, or possibly the submissive one, right? He doesn't say that. You know, I got married. I was 20 years old. My wife was 18. Been married now 41 years. Things change, right? Things change. I was telling Pastor Jesse earlier, and that was long before Jesus in our life, and we go dancing. I love to go down to the palace and match and all. That's when the Whiskey Row was Whiskey Row. There were so many bars there, and we popped from one to the next. And let me tell you, my wife, she was hot. We'd dress her up, and back then, you know, it was the brush poppers, you know, for the guys, that brush popper. And what was the jeans the girls wore? It's called the Rockies. Those Rockies would look, make any tail just look, woo, you know. And she wore a set that had a belt here and then a little V cut right here, right? Well, it's not the same. He's not saying, you know, hey, you're down in your marriage, and all of a sudden you're, you're still wanting this. Well, maybe the young. He said, no, the affection do. 
to that bride, right? I'm not the same either. Oh, I'm really close. No, but anyway. No, he doesn't say that. Every wife is due that affection, right? His emphasis on giving what is due and rendering it. He says, render what is due. Basically, he's saying, you're saying, I owe you this. I owe you. I owe what is due to you. And that is that affection you render. The wife to the husband, the husband to the wife. Not you owe me, right? You owe me, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm bringing you in the living, you know. It's my pension that has secured our living. No, it's not I, you owe me. See, the wife is due that is affection. And if we bring it into the wife, why? Because she's your wife, man. Man, because she is your wife, you see? And that's why that affection is due. Now, Paul speaks of this affection due, and obviously we can put it into that sexual relationship, right? Within the marriage. But more so, that affection due, just the affection of love, church. Can you teach your children that? Can you teach the grandchildren that? You know, when I got married, and like I say, that was many years ago, well, a lot, what drove it was lust, right? Be honest with you. It was lust. Well, I said, and I always have said, I love my wife, but that was driven much by lust then. But as years go on, years go on, and then that affection do is in love, just in pure love, you see? That is part of it. Romance, the romance of love. Not necessarily the act of a sexual relationship, but the romance and love, and that continues on. That's the affection due, to love your wife, man. You know, the Bible tells us in Ephesians, and it's a high calling for men, that men are to love their wives as Jesus loves the church, as Jesus loves you. Think about that. That is one high calling. I don't know that any man can ever reach that pinnacle of being a husband. But he tells us that. He tells a husband, for you husband, love him. Show him that affection do. Like I say, I want to make a note here also. The affection do is still do. It's always do, you see. Even if they're not physically able. For many, as you get older, maybe you're not physically able anymore for that sexual relationship, but there is an affection due, and that is in romance. That is in loving that one. A married couple still have, can still have that affectionate, affectionate relationship. You know, I see it. Uh, there's this old couple that comes into Casa Sanchez, where I love to go to dinner. And uh, they're old, I'm telling you. They both get out of the car and they grab their walkers and they come on in there, you know. He was a World War, no. He was a yeah, World War II Korean and Vietnam vet. He had a hat like this. And I went up and shook his hand twice, three times, man. But they come in there. This couple is so affectionate to one another. He just helps her up that step and brings her in. He's got his hand around her. He's holding her hand. You know, They go sit down. And if you hear their conversations, it's affection due. You know, it is beautiful. It's such a beautiful thing when you witness that. Ah, uh, that affection. You know, and go back to verse 3 here. 3 through 4, guys. It says, let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Paul is quick, as I said, to put him on equal grounds. In this area, in a marriage, you are on equal grounds as a husband and the wife. Each are due. The authority, he says, of the body. It's equal there. The husband to the wife, the wife to the husband, vice versa. Why is this? Because the Bible says you become one flesh. Because you are one, right? You are one. You become this one flesh. Two, equal in marriage. The beautiful thing. Mark 10, 6 through 8. 
Jesus says, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female for a purpose. When he made Adam and Eve, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be what? Joined to his wife. That was a sexual relationship. That was to be joined. And the two now shall become this one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Two that are equal. And in that area, that affection do, you see? One flesh. And each do that affection. It's a gift. It's a gift God gives to marriage. In verse 4, he said, The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband doesn't have authority over his own body, but the wife does. By the way, this will never justify for a husband coercing his wife, saying, Lord, well, i got authority over your body. Let me tell you what, I'll slap that man silly. No, that's not what it's saying. The point is, is each have a binding obligation to one another in a marriage, right? A binding obligation to serve their spouse, serve their spouse with affection. And that affection that is due, as he says there, guys, when you think about that, that it's the most awesome obligation. I think about my marriage back, you know. Ever struggles. Never struggled in the beginning. I'll tell you why, because I didn't have God in my life. I didn't have God's word. I only wish when I was 20 years old, somebody sat down to me and showed me this and literally showed me these things. Would it have changed things? I believe so, because it's so true. Hmm. It's an awesome obligation one to another, to serve one another. Over the billions of people upon this earth, God has given you the one, right? God has given me my one. Those in marriage. Ah, and two that are equal, right? In verse 5, go on there. Do not deprive. This is interesting as Paul goes in here. He says, do not deprive one another except now with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now, he is definitely speaking about the intimacy of a sexual relationship here, right? It's more than the affection to do. It is just straight on, right? He says, do not deprive that one of the affection, the intimacy in that marriage. Never deprive him. He says, come back together. What's that mean? Come back together in the bed, obviously. Paul rejects the idea that sustaining from that, from sex, is, makes you any more holy. And he's speaking right there to that, that Corinth church. It doesn't make you any more holy. It doesn't make you godlier by doing that. God ordained it in a marriage, and that's what it should be. God created man and woman for it, and that is what it should be. You know, I would tell the young people, when you teach the whole thing to a young person, a teenager, when that time comes, when you're married, and that first time in the bed, with, by the way, your virgin, right? You're in that bed. Give God thanks. Give him thanks for a beautiful, beautiful thing within a marriage. Absolutely. He says, do not deprive, don't do any sexual deprivation of your spouse, right? Deprive them of that. It has not only to do with some kind of frequency, right? The frequency of that relationship. He says, do not deprive them. You know, we can think about that with uh, romance also. Just romance. What is romance, you know? Well, that's affection too. Don't deprive of them that and don't deprive them of the, just the romance that's due, the romance of a marriage. You know, I can tell you, man, we can struggle with that. I'll just be honest with you. Can you struggle with that, man? Maybe not. Maybe you're one of those romantic guys. I struggle. I'll be the only one in this room that struggles with romance. When my wife plans something, wow, we're going away. It's romantic. I try to... Oh, romantic to me. Bring a flower home, right? Take her out to dinner. That's, no, we need a rope. Maybe we need a class for us men in romance. And my brother Terry could probably lead it, right? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. He could lead that. He could lead that class for us. Amen. Oh, romance in a marriage. That's the affection, dude. You see? I think about it. Some of the greatest times with my bride is, well, number one, dancing. You know, we found this place. It's out there uh, at the farm. Um, they used to, what's it called out there? Now, Mortimer's Farm. And they have a barn dance. In fact, it's going on right now. Well, not now, but in the evening. And they got this area, and they got live bands there. It's all open air. They'll serve dinner if you want to buy their dinner. And uh, you go there and go dancing. And we went out dancing. It was such a great time because it's not like a, being in a bar and having all this alcohol. I think they serve some beers and stuff there. But, but anyway, it was a great time. And sometimes that's the greatest, you know, holding my, my bride's hand. Walking down, you know, putting an arm around her, giving her a kiss. You know, a lot of times in a restaurant, I just lean over and give my wife a kiss, you know. Those are the best times. Maybe that's romance, you know. I'm still not good at it. And the fact is, the Bible, Paul says that affection is due. You know, that affection is due from the husband to the wife, obviously from the wife to the husband. In verse 5, but he says, do not deprive, right? <clears throat> do not deprive one another except with consent for a time, he says, that you may give yourselves now to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. He's basically saying, you've got to set a time to this and probably keep the time short. And it is. Maybe there needs to be prayer and fasting. You know, Jesus told his disciples when they said, we couldn't cast out this demon. And then Jesus does it. He says, the hard things come with fasting and prayer. Well, maybe there's something. Maybe it's a wayward child. Maybe something going on in your life. And there needs to be fasting and prayer. But guess what? It's on both sides of both couples. And you agree for this time. Marriage is all about communication. You know, maybe there's a time for that fasting and prayer within a relationship. It's okay when it's in a sense of seeking God, right? A time set that's agreed upon between the husband. But then he says, what? Now you come back together again. Don't deprive, don't deprive, deprive, I'm sorry, being that one flesh again. I want to make a note here, all right? Not that anybody would do that. But this idea, this thought of fast and prayer is not to be used as some kind of punishment, right? Oh, honey, I'm fasting now. You ain't getting near me. By the way, I'm praying, honey, you know. I'm deep in prayer. It's not that. You tipped me off, and so now I fast from you, right? <laughs> I fast from you there. No, it's not that. You know, not so fast, dear. Uh-uh. Nah, nah, stay back. It's not about hurting. It's not about vengeance. It's not about punishment. It is about having that time with God, right? Husband and wife. What a beautiful thing. A beautiful thing. And maybe there comes a time when that needs to be. Why did, was Paul so clear? For a time, he said. Set it up prior there's something dealing within your marriage, maybe, or within your, that you too, as a couple, want to pray about. And part of that fasting is that, is that, right? Then set it up. Set it up prior, and then both agree. Why does he say you need to agree with that? Because of Satan's temptations, you see. That Satan will use that. Satan loves it when the affection due is not given in a marriage. That's a God-ordained marriage, you understand? Satan loves it when there's not that affection that is taking place within a marriage. He loves that, and that's where he works. He loves couples at odds. Man, I got some victory here. Even though they're in the same house, maybe they're in different rooms and beds, right? I've known that. Oh, Satan loves that. He's had victory. Why? Because he's broken what God made perfect, a marriage. He's tore it apart, right? His temptation, Satan loves it when there's no affection showed. Loves it when the time of, well, the sexual relationship is just separated. Oh, Satan uses that. Hmm. He loves that. What causes many divorces? 
You know, what causes that? Well, many times it starts. It starts there with you, Satan using God's design and breaking it, right? The sex and the affection stops all of a sudden. There's deprivation. And Satan has an area for temptation. I'm talking man, I'm talking woman. There's room for that, right? What causes these divorces? Well, they entered into the devil's workshop, in a sense, by that affection due not coming anymore. And adultery can follow, obviously. When that affection due stops, Satan gets victory. Satan will provide a new opportunity for that. He said there, because of worrying about any sexual immorality, going out, stepping out. What can cause those divorce? Well, another opportunity. Guys, most cases of adultery starts, it starts with the affection due and the sex stopping, right, between a couple. That's where the adultery starts. And many times where they're at, maybe in the workplace, you know, that's one of those places that adultery takes place the most because there's someone there who's now going to hear them Going to lend an ear to that man, lend an ear to that woman. Hear them, those ones, interested in what's going on, right? Actually compassionate. And then he starts talking about his wife, or she starts talking about her husband, this thing that's going on, you know? And then Satan gets at work there, man. You know, I understand your frustration. He'll go or she will go, right? You know, you're, you're right. You're right in what you're saying. And then self-control goes out the window. Any type of self-conscience goes out the window. And a marriage is ruined. A marriage is ruined. You know, marriage, marriage outside of God's design, with that being that intimacy of that marriage, right? With the affection, without that being in there, Satan will attack, and he will have victory. Only a matter of time, one way or another, you know. And I'll say what I call, can be called, and, well, I will say sexless marriage, or I will say an intimate-less marriage. You know what I mean? Satan will have his way there. When no affection is at home, God, Satan has victory. Even if not, neither one of them step out, Satan is still divided what God put together as one. Even if neither one of them ever step out, Satan's had victory. If one does step out, Satan's had victory, you see. They went elsewhere, and that victory comes. And, you know, any more, guys, the Internet, women, the Internet, everybody thinks, well, pornography, that's only something man does. I can't tell you how many people, how many ladies, and sometimes young ladies have had a problem with pornography, right? They step out, they want, and, and Satan will have that victory. You might ask, well, what happened? You know, what happened to the, all this? Things were so good. How did Satan have this victory? Well, I can tell you one thing. It wasn't, had nothing to do with God. It was not God's doing. In James 1.15, Then when desire has conceived... It gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. And it brings forth death of a marriage, and it brings forth what God had ordained in that marriage, you see. It brings forth death, and the victory is to the enemy. Man, I don't want to give the enemy any victory. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived, church. God's given you a gift of a perfect, perfect spouse. I hope this goes out on line to many. God's given you a gift of a perfect spouse, a gift of, of the affection due, you know, that affection due towards her. In James 1, beginning in uh, verse 16, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. What is one of those gifts? It is a bride. It is a groom. Those things come from God. And comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. God has given that 
perfect gift, you see. Every good and precious gift of a spouse. Show the affection due. You know, next week, as we continue our study, and Paul speaks about that of being single, right? For those who are single. And there's much to be learned there. But in closing here, I want to close this way. You know, there's another good and perfect gift that has been given to each one of us. Or maybe you haven't received it, and that is Jesus. He has been given that perfect gift. John 3, 16, for God to love the world that he gave. He gave a perfect gift to his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but now have everlasting life. A perfect gift, by the way, of affection due. Affection due to you and me as we believe. God says, here, I'm giving you this gift, and it's due you now, right? It's yours. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourself. It's a gift of God, right? Much as a husband to a wife, much as a wife to a husband, it is a gift, and it's a perfect gift. And he says, not of works, lest any one should boast. If you're here this morning or you're watching this online and you, you haven't received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to give you that opportunity to receive the affection that is due that God has given for you. Everybody bow their heads and close their eyes and just pray. And Lord Jesus, thank you, Lord. Thank you for marriage. Thank you, Lord, for that beautiful gift. I thank you for my bride, Lord. Though she's not here this morning, I thank you so much. I pray that she's having a, a good time with my daughter. For those who want to receive Jesus, just pray along this line. Say, Lord, I come to you. I come to you in belief, in faith in you. I confess to you. I'm a sinner, Lord Jesus. I confess I'm in need of a Savior. Lord, I know there's an affection that you have for me, a love that will never end. Lord Jesus, I receive you as my Lord and Savior this morning. Father, fill me with your spirit. Help me to walk by your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, praise the Lord. Uh, if there's anybody out online or anybody here that has given their life to the Lord for the first time, please uh, come forward for prayer. And if you're out online there, uh, find you a good Bible teaching church. Learn more. God's word speaks of everything. Amen, church? Let me pray. We got our last worship song. Father, we just thank you, Lord. Thank you again for your wonderful, wonderful word, Lord. I pray that it encourages us. Encourage those married couple. And as next week, Lord Jesus, we speak about those things, uh, those who aren't married, and maybe widows or widowers, Lord. You have a word for us there too. You don't leave anything out, God. We thank you and praise you. We give you our hearts. We give you our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.